Because quoting the Bible to prove a point doesn't prove anything unless you believe in the Bible, assuming you know what it means, which is problematic. Quoting the Bible to justify policy on abortion, policy toward um, gay people, health care policy, or whatever, doesn't do anything unless you happen to believe in that document. And the United States is not a Christian nation. The Congress of the United States said that in 1787. John Adams said that, that it is not a Christian nation. And so to try to impose Christian dogma, Christian precepts, uh, is inimical to our constitutional process. Justice Roberts said this in the Nebia versus New York Supreme Court decision. He said, the Constitution does not secure to anyone liberty to conduct his business in such a fashion as to inflict injury upon the public at large or upon any substantial group of people. And he went on to say that religion seeks to do just that in the public sphere. We have separation of church and state for good reason. Because the religious process of discerning truth, of viewing human nature, of deciding how we learn the truth and how the truth should be spelled, or should be uh, disseminated, is directly at variance with the democratic process uh, that we find in the Constitution. And so that's my position, that the founders were very right to have this absolute wall, as it's called, of separation of church and state, not just in terms of establishing a state church, but in terms of letting religious dogma dictate public policy. Uh, and he did not say a democracy if you can keep it. He said a republic if you can keep it. And that was after implementing these anti-democratic principles that Professor Ray has outlined. Namely, appointment of judges and the Electoral College was not a democracy that he was putting in place. Also, emphatically, Professor Ray did not answer the question whether businesses have a right to discriminate. And I'm standing here before you and telling you that businesses have a right to discriminate. Well, you call it discrimination or anything else, but let's be honest here. If a business utilizes their resources to put up a brick and mortar building and is offering something to the general public, nobody has a right to come in and dictate how it is that they're going to run their business. So we, we've seen a number of things go on. We saw a photographer in New Mexico. We saw a florist in Washington. We saw a baker in Oregon. We saw a farm in New York. We saw all of these things go on where the government used force to shut them down or sanction them or find them in some way. And all we're suggesting and all I'm suggesting is that the Constitution means what it says. That government cannot use force to abridge the free exercise of religion. So if you have individuals that are running a business and they have sincerely held religious beliefs and they choose not to provide something to someone because it would violate those religious beliefs, that the Constitution protects them. Let, I am not here suggesting that what those business owners did was right. What I'm actually suggesting to you is that in America you have a right to be a bigot. And the market forces are so much more compelling than government force. And we know that because the First Amendment says just that. It's designed to protect the individual who runs a business from having to behave in ways that would violate his religious freedoms. This is not about discrimination. It's about ensuring that individuals are not discriminating, being discriminated against as they run their business. Would anybody agree that someone coming to a Jewish photographer, the Aryan nation, comes to the Jewish photographer and says, you will come to our neo-Nazi rally and take photographs? There's nobody in their right mind who would say, sorry, the First Amendment doesn't protect you. Or what about the Muslim caterer? And someone comes to them and says, you're going to serve pork. And we're paying you to serve pork. There's no one, I believe, in their right mind that would compel the Muslim to provide a service in violation of their deeply held religious beliefs. And I think the same thing applies to the, to the uh, same-sex couple, to the homosexual who owns a business who is, say, he's driving a cab. And uh, someone waves him down and says, hey, I want to go down to the anti-gay rally. And the homosexual who owns the, tag, uh, the cab company says, sorry, not taking you, not providing the service. I would stand behind that decision just the same. Because it's about freedom. And it's about protecting these ideas that government should not be able to force individuals to behave in a certain way, so long as they're not violating the fundamental freedoms of the individual. 
and you do not have a right to go into a business and force them to provide, to provide a service to you. So my, 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 my question is really this. Do we lose our faith when we decide to start a business? Do we leave our faith at the door when we put our resources towards establishing something where we're going to provide service? Emphatically, no. We all believe, I, at least I'm, I'm assuming some things, that we believe government should follow the rules. I would, I would be surprised if there's anyone here that says government should not have to follow the rules. Guess what one of the rules is? Congress shall make no law abridging the free exercise of religion. As it relates to freedom, is the Constitution limiting the principle of failure? Is it an ideal worth working towards? The limiting principle is only a failure because we've allowed it to become a failure. We haven't enforced the Constitution. We live in a society of a, of a people that in large part are apathetic. Uh, we lack knowledge with respect to the Constitution and what its purpose ultimately is. We lack knowledge as to what it actually means to have, to have power within the people. We ourselves having that power to decide uh, how it is that we're going to govern ourselves and how we go about enforcing this document called the Constitution of the United States. And as a result, what have we done? When you have the people that are uninformed and misinformed as to this document and what it means to be free, we in turn will elect individuals who don't understand what it means to be free and what it means to uphold and defend the Constitution according to the, to the oath. I happen to believe that your word is your bond. And when you promise that you're going to uphold something, that you actually do it. And if you don't like the Constitution and you don't like the limiting principles, don't run for office. Don't run for office and then take an oath and then violate the oath once you get there. I, I'm reminded of one particular congressman out of South Carolina who was asked on national TV uh, about health care. And I'm not here to debate health care, but he's illustrating a principle. He says, uh, well, most of what we do in Washington, D.C. is uh, in violation of the Constitution. How can that be? That somebody can go on national TV and say, yeah, most of what we do in Washington, D.C is in violation of the Constitution and have no qualms about making that claim. And we see it over and over and over again. Disregard of the Constitution. The limiting principle, our Constitution can be summarized with two underlying principles. Men and women are born free, and men and women cannot be trusted with power. That's what our Constitution is all about. And you maximize freedom by embracing the limiting principle. When you embrace the limiting principle, people are able to choose how they want to live their lives, not how government wants them to live their lives, not how a politician wants them to live their lives. You abide by those limiting principles, people experience those things that they typically would want to pursue, a job, a family, an education, speaking out in a protest, whatever the case may be. So the limiting principle, historically speaking, is not a failure. Because we know that in order to ensure that government does their job, you must limit them. It has become a failure today only because we haven't enforced it. And so I believe that the Tenth Amendment means what it, means what it says. And that is, those powers not given to the federal government remain with the states and with the people. If that's the case then, why have we the people allowed 250 bureaucracies to be created who impose over 6,000 regulations onto the American people every year? There's a very simple reason. The limiting principle has been disregarded. Not only by us, by individuals that we're electing. And as a result, government is telling us to do, with, uh, uh, telling us to do certain things with our money, telling us to do certain things with our property, telling us to do certain things when it comes to raising our children, telling us to do certain things when it comes to education. That was never the original intention. Let's get back to the limiting principle and start to experience real freedom once again. The U.S. Constitution is to establish a government. If you look at that word government, to govern, the root of that word is to regulate or to control. Government regulations, by their very nature, limit individual freedom. They either tell you you cannot do something or you must do something, but they limit individual freedom. They limit individual freedom because that is the only way of achieving the common or the public good. 
If one carries out to its logical conclusion this idea that government <coughs> should not in any way limit our freedom, the logical conclusion of this is that what we should be supporting is anarchy. I'm not using anarchy in a pejorative sense. Anarchy simply means having no government. That if one wants, at least on the surface, maximum freedom, support anarchy, where no one tells you what to do. Of course, under such a system, no one would have freedom because uh, the life of people would be poor, nasty, brutish, and sharp because there would be no agency providing for protection, order, security in society. Chief Justice Waite, in a Supreme Court decision, Munn versus Illinois, said, when one becomes a member of society, he necessarily parts with some rights or privileges which, as an individual not affected by his relations with others, he might retain. The Constitution of the state of Massachusetts says a body politic is a social compact by which the whole people covenants with each citizen and each citizen with the whole people that all shall be governed by certain laws for the common good. It does authorize the establishment of laws requiring each citizen so to conduct himself as not necessarily to injure another. And this is the very essence of government. From this source comes the police powers of the state. Under these powers, the government regulates the conduct of its citizens one toward the other. That's the essence of government, which I would say is a necessary protection to protect citizens from fraud, to protect citizens uh, from the antisocial actions of others, to promote the common good. Uh, the American political philosopher John Dewey said, when private actions have public consequences, these private actions must be regulated to produce the common good. And only government can deal with things like negative externalities, regulating those to promote the public good, uh, dealing with the free rider problem, uh, dealing with market failures. Uh, corporations are not a substitute for government because the goal of a corporation is to maximize profit, not to produce the common welfare or the general good of citizens. And if you look at American history, it's replete with examples of how unchecked corporate power is inimical to the general welfare and the common good. So the point of carrying this argument that the Constitution should be interpreted as providing freedom flies in the face of reality in the sense that it establishes a government and governments by their very nature regulate people. The hope is that the citizens impact those regulations but they still limit individual freedom. That's the essence of the government process. <coughs> Living and breathing interpretation of the Constitution versus strict constructionism or originalism. Thomas Jefferson said this, the Constitution, he said, belongs to the living and not the dead. Even Jefferson, uh, who is cited frequently as a defender of individual rights, realized that the Constitution was not and could not be and should not be a static document, that it had to change with the times. As I mentioned earlier, Jefferson actually suggested a new Constitution for each new generation. I think what we have to remember is the Constitution serves a higher purpose than itself. It is an instrument of government in order to achieve the purposes that are listed in the preamble to the Constitution. And those purposes provide justice and tranquility and all those purposes that I'm sure you know can only be achieved by government protection and by government regulation. 
In another sense, too, saying that you want a strict interpretation of the Constitution, whatever Constitution you're referring to, the one of 1787 before the Bill of Rights, the one with the Bill of Rights, wherever you cut it, doesn't really make a lot of sense because it's very hard if you want to base it on the original intent of the founders, you may not know what they intended. Also, it was a jointly drafted document that required compromise. And as a result, language at times was purposely vague and ambiguous. The necessary and proper clause, equal protection of the laws, regulation of interstate commerce, those were perfect, or purposely left vague in order to enable the government to meet the demands of a changing time. Another question is whose intent count? Not only did members of the Constitutional Convention disagree, but so did those who voted on ratification. And even if the intent of the founders is clear, does it matter today? So many hundreds of years after the Constitution was founded. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said this, the provisions of the Constitution are not mathematical formulas. They're organic, living institutions. Times have changed, and no written document written hundreds of years ago can anticipate changes <coughs> in society. And it's this may sound heretical, there could be things in the Constitution that are wrong. There certainly were when it was originally drafted. Although it didn't specifically mention slavery, it tolerated it, for example. Even Justice Scalia, who is cited as a bastion of strict constructionism, uh, strict construction of the Constitution, uh, he does not call himself that. He says he's a, an originalist, and he is original. <laughs> he said a text should not be construed strictly, and it shouldn't be construed leniently. It should be construed reasonably to contain all that it fairly means. Now, he doesn't always say that, because he has also said that any emphasis on the rights of women is displaced because it isn't mentioned in the Constitution specifically. Uh, he said that in another case. I prefer what he said uh, about how you look at what is reasonable in making your interpretation uh, of the Constitution. The point is, no document can remain unchanged and also at the same time remain relevant to, in this case, modern political times and modern political issues. It is just unheard of. Uh, religious teachings change over time to meet changing conditions. The same should apply in terms of the Constitution, that it cannot be fixed once and for all. Very briefly, too, going back to strict instructionism, uh, sometimes people say, well, look at the words of the Constitution. But that doesn't necessarily help you much either, because each word in the English language is capable of 25 different meanings. There are a lot of words in the Constitution. Um, how do we know exactly what these words mean? Look at the difficulty over interpreting and the debates over necessary and proper. And even when words are clear, like the Second Amendment, um, which is cited as guaranteeing individual rights to own guns, people conveniently forget the first part that relates it to the necessity of a militia. So even when the words are clear and plain, uh, sometimes for political purposes, those are ignored. I think at this point, that's, uh, the, the fundamental difference between our, our worldviews here is rather clear. Uh, uh, Dr. Wright believes that the Constitution is designed to limit the actions of the individual. I believe that the Constitution is designed to limit the actions of government. It's a fundamental distinction. Mm -hmm. Is the Constitution a living and breathing document? A living and breathing document is no Constitution.